Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. I'm Graham Donaldson and I'm joined today by AJ Hannenberg Here. and Catherine Ball. Here. A new addition to the podcast. Catherine, in the tradition of the Classical Stuff You Should Know podcast, can you tell me, tell the listeners a little bit what it, who you are and what you teach at Veritas and who you, and your, what was it, what are the words you use? Credentials? Credentials. Credentials. Your street cred. Your classical cred? Your classical cred. Ooh, okay. Well, I was not warned of any of this in advance, so I'm going to have to try to do this on the fly. Well, as was said just now, my name is Catherine Ball. I teach 11th grade American literature. I co-teach 12th grade literature with these fine gentlemen here and a few other things. My previous experience with classical education before coming to Veritas was being classically educated in grammar school. And so classical education has been something near and dear to my heart for a very long time. But enough about me. I am very anxious to hear what Graham has to share with us. That's story. right. Catherine, we, AJ and I are the great unwashed, whereas Catherine is the one that who has been trained in classical <laughs> education great from birth. Gosh. We had to go with unwashed. That's, <laughs> that's the phrasing right. that we use. Isn't Dirty? that? Uh, that's, that's gross. No, like the hoi polloi. What in heaven's name does that mean? Is that right, Hawaiian? <laughs> All right, maybe I'm the maybe I'm the you mean you all are the great unwashed. All right, um, so today's to- today's topic, um, something that I something that I have not evidently just uh, displayed is about the virtue of the Christian knight. So as a tenth grade teacher, uh, I teach a lot of the Middle Ages stuff, and this talks about uh, in the in tenth grade we talk a lot about who or what is a Christian knight. Now, a little bit about knighthood in historical context. So, in the Middle Ages, the knight class was this class that was sort of below the ruling class of the king and the aristocracy, but they were above the peasants. And in the Middle Ages, you had this sort of weird technological thing happened, and that is that all wars were fought with bladed weapons and with... uh, um, um, Pointy swords, weapons? yeah, swords and shields and, and, and lances and, and halberks and that kind of thing. Actually, halberk is, is uh, armor. But, um, but they, were, they invented this thing that was the mail, either full plate mail or they also had chain mail. It was very expensive to make and only the upper class could, could have it. And this meant that all of the rich people were invulnerable to dying in battle, pretty much. It was incredibly rare for somebody who is wearing full plate mail or full or wearing chain mail to actually die in war. And this created actually quite a really interesting um, social problem. And that is all of a sudden you have the sort of the rich upper class members of society who could essentially come out the other side of a battle virtually guaranteed of not dying. This is not true for the peasantry. So this created a bit of a problem, especially for society. You had these people who could um, throw their weight around. They could be actual jerks and know that they could get away with it because what is a peasant wearing a T-shirt going to do if the uh, if the if these people that were wealthy had uh, had plate mail or and chain a mail horse, and, and a horse and, and all these sorts of things and nice weapons that were exactly break. and they could and there was nothing going to happen. Right. So what arose was this idea of chivalry. Now chivalry. First, uh, as the sort of name suggests, chivalry came from how to take care of your horse and how to do like horsey stuff. Chevalier, um, cheveux is the French word for horse. Well, I was wondering if you were going to get around. <laughs> yeah. So cheveux is the French word for horse. So chivalry was like horse stuff. But this became basically the code of conduct of what these knights were, how they were supposed to act. Um, if you were to take another knight captive... How do you negotiate his release? If you were to win something in a pitched battle, how are you to sort of figure out? Because everyone's still alive at the end of it. They're sort of beaten up and, and hurt. Are all the, the aristocrats, all the, the knights were still alive. How do you now like figure out where all the chips fall after some sort of conflict while well, you had this sort of code of chivalry? So this sort of code of honorable conduct arose where you have these this knightly class um, and they all sort of lived by this code of honor. Um, and the, the sort of the topic for today is that um, there was a the highest there was one virtue that the knightly class themselves were supposed to keep all of their um, gaze upon. Do you guys, either of you, know what the highest virtue of the Christian knight was? I do not. 
I'm gonna venture fidelity. It was not fidelity, although that's a good one. And we'll talk about what the the Christian knight's idea of troth is in a second. But the highest virtue I'm of, I'm ninety percent convinced you're making up every single I'm not word making up any of this. No, no, <laughs> no, this is real stuff. This is true. We'll talk All about right. troth. Um, it's where we get the word betrothed. Troth. So Once, you pledge your troth. That's right. You give your tr- you give your truth to somebody. You oh. give your All word. Right. Um, but the highest virtue of the Christian knight was sort of strangely charity. Hmm. So charity was supposed to be the highest virtue of the Christian knight. Now, charity nowadays, when we talk about charity, what do we usually think about? Giving to the poor. That's right. Giving money to the poor. But the old virtue of charity was the was a love in, and caritas. It was the giving. It was the love that gives without expecting anything else in return. It's the love that Jesus showed on the cross, that he emptied himself and gave himself up for, uh, uh, for the world. Uh, it, was a, it was charitable love, uh, agape love, that kind of thing. So the idea of charitable love was supposed to be the highest virtue of the Christian knight. Um, and in, so in many ways, the Christian knight was almost like this weird philosopher of love. Charity was supposed to be the thing that he thought about the most, Charity was supposed to be uh, the thing that he held as his highest ideal and what he fought for. So really, instead of the way we would conceive of knights now as being valor-centered and and honor and glory-centered, which is Mm -hmm. probably a selfish notion, they're they're really focused on loving without expecting things in return. That's right. So this is kind of a transformation from the ancient ideals that you see with some of the the, uh, Homeric characters who were their own sense of honor and their own sense of valor was ideal. And if their honor was besmirched, you have that very sort of Roman idea of falling on your sword as a very honorable thing to do. You mm-hmm. got besmirched, you're going to fall on your sword, and all your kids are going to be like, Dad was awesome. Um, but that sort of falls away in the Christian tradition when you get into the Middle Ages. You don't see knights falling on their swords. You don't see them honorably killing themselves at all. At all. Is a piece of that because the Catholic Church looked not fondly on the idea of suicide? And one of the reasons why they don't look fondly on suicide is, I mean, among other things, a giving up on God's creation. Suicide is a giving up on God's creation. But in terms of being a knight, it was... Uh, a sort of a failure of your mission. In fact, a lot of the knight stories that we have are not knights going off and being these sort of valorous uh, butt kickers, which although there is a couple of those stories, but a lot of the knights in classical tradition are often um, going through great trials and misadventures. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Red Cross Knight getting thrown in jail um, in The Fairy Queen Mm -hmm. or the the, the Dungeons of the Giant. You have these knights that go through sort of almost these... um, which would classically be looked at as like honor destroying actions. Mm-hmm. You have the Christian knights sort of enduring these kinds of things with mm-hmm. with great distinction. Like uh, Sir Gawain. Yeah. yeah. And so Sir Gawain is a great example of, of talking about uh, the idea of charitable love in action. And so the Christian knight is supposed do we, to be, Do we need to say who Sir Gawain yeah, is we'll, for those who don't, so we'll talk, don't really know? So Sir Gawain was one of the knights of, of Arthur's court, and he was King Arthur's nephew, and he was supposed to be the most courteous, well-mannered knight. And the famous story of him is called Sir Gawain the Green Knight, and this is one of the texts that we study in 10th grade. Um, and it is a text that is... Uh, uh, a trial. Sir Gawain goes through this trial of going to the um, the sort of Green Knight's castle. Maybe there's a whole other podcast we could do on the actual story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. <laughs> I thought you meant reading it was a trial when you said. Oh no no no! Reading it is not a trial. trial. Reading it is very fun. It's also very <laughs> fun to read at Christmas time because it takes place all at Christmas. And the knight is all green and covered in holly and gold. And that's right. And he's a big grump. He's, yeah, he's kind of. Kind of a grump, and he's, he's also, also kind of great. And he might be a fairy, which is kind of interesting, which is not how we think about fairies. That's a whole other topic. Different kind of fairy than you're thinking. That's right, not Tinkerbell. Yeah. Anyway, so knights as sort of philosophers of love, um, and this is why often you have these stories where knights are tempted by ladies, like Sir Gawain the Green Knight being the, a great example, where you have uh, these ladies uh, who are tempting the knights um, to uh, sort of give themselves over to sort of a, a baser sexual love, whereas the knights are supposed to be these philosophers of this sort of higher uh, charitable love. So um, 
So where was I going with this? So we have, shoot, what were we talking about? This is but, embarrassing. Uh, you were talking, I mean, it seemed like we had sort of put a cap on most of the things you were covering. I'm not sure where we were headed with it. Maybe You're talking about charity. Sir Gawain as an example of the Christian knight? That's right. Sir Gawain is the example of the Christian knight and the high view of charity. Is there anything more to say? I mean, there's like lots to say, but we'd have to go into like all of Sir Gawain the Green Knight. Is that a bad thing? No. In the meantime, I have a question. That oh, let's hear your question. Things brought up, and that is... At what point did this concept of a code of chivalry develop? Do we know anything of how it came to be as opposed to just springing up out of nowhere? Ah, so that's good. Thank you. That's a great question because that was kind of where, that was the thing I was trying to remember. Yes. So um, we have this ancient honor code where honor was supposed to be the central thing of the ancient hero. And then this idea of charity is this almost like Christian reimagining of the hero. So when you get these stories of the Christian knight, you're getting these, the, the authors are, especially in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, they are consciously trying to retell the stories of the classical heroes, but with the Christian virtues in mind. Mm. Um, so the one of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is a actual re trying to retell the story of Paris and Helen. And this is a little strange because the story of Paris and Helen, Paris is coming to Menelaus's house and he's stealing Helen away and the whole Iliad happens and the fall of Troy. That causes thousands yeah. upon thousands of deaths and the end of a civilization. Exactly. And Sir Gawain the Green Knight, actually in the first stanza of Sir Gawain the Green Knight, they make a reference to Troy. Um, so any classical reader would be like, oh, I know the story of Troy. But the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is this retelling of what would a Christian hero do as opposed to this Homeric hero. The Homeric hero goes in, sees a pretty lady and says, I want that, and takes her away and doesn't care about the strife. Whereas Sir Gawain is this hero who's in the very similar situation. He's in somebody else's house. He uh, sees a very beautiful woman who happens to be the host's wife. Um, and in this story, the host's wife throws herself at the Christian knight, and he goes through this very long uh, um, story of sort of rebuffing her advances. Um, always, and if you look at all three of the, the nights that she, or sorry, the mornings that she comes and tries to talk to him, he uses this Christian virtue of charity as the thing that sort of wards off the woman from turning into a second Troy. So the Christian knight is, is sort of this like recasting of the classical hero. And in the Middle Ages, I would argue that they're very much saying, what would these ancient stories have looked like if we had had characters who had who adhered to these Christian virtues, which are like these baptized version of the classical virtues. So charity is kind of like this baptized um, honor as opposed to um, striving and serving for your own name, you're striving and serving for the name of God. Um, and so, um, yeah, so we get these, these Christian knights who are uh, um, seeking and striving after virtue. Um, I tell my students that there's kind of um, lots of different cultures have this idea of the sort of honorable warrior. The Japanese have the samurai and the Americans have the cowboy. Um, and then the... That's, that's our version? It is. Can Canada doesn't have anything. Maybe the Mountie. That, we kind of get close to that with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police with the red and the... They're and called the Mounties. Kind of, they're called Mounties, yes. Um, there are, they're, they're Canada's version of the FBI. Oh, I've seen them. Yeah, they're cool. <laughs> they're cool, yeah. So it's kind of recasting what people in power should do with that power. Exactly. So you, and I find, that's the thing that I find very fascinating is you have this technological advancement. You've mm -hmm. got plate mail, you've got chain mail, you have this ability where the wealthy and the elite of society are essentially, um, uh, they can't easily die in combat. And so you have the church coming in and saying, what do we need to, um, sort of backfill this technological advance in order to keep society honorable. And then they, they appeal to the knight's sense of their Christian fidelity and Christian duty 
um, to this code of chivalry with the highest virtue of charity. And that kind of leaves the question, um, all right, so if we have other technological advances that are equally as disruptive as the spurs for a horse or as the plate mail, what kinds of, of codes of conduct and virtues do we have that can sort of come in the background and, and backfill so that with this um, uh, increase in power, we don't have an increase in vice because we can, yeah. Would you, would you say that the rules of engagement that the military follows is that sort of thing? I, I think mean, it's, it's part of it. It's kind of a code of chivalry. You don't shoot unless shot at. Sure. I mean, we have, yeah, and I think we have these things. Um, that I, I think it's sort of, a, it would be a fun exercise to actually sit down and think about, like, what particular kinds of behaviors do specific technological advances uh, engender and what sort of things can you develop to make sure that those maybe negative behaviors uh, don't run amok. Because like I, like I tell my students, it would be like giving an entire class of 17-year-old boys, um, letting them wear football equipment to school and um, telling and then letting them basically like run loose in the hallway. They're going to like body check each other and then eventually... Every once in a while, they're going to, like, hit some poor peasant. <laughs> that would be sad. So not to reduce it to a cliche, but it is a little bit like the classic Uncle Ben from Spider-Man line of That's right. with great power comes great responsibility. That's right. Uncle Ben uh, giving us lessons from beyond the grave. Um, exactly. It's that kind of thing. Um, uh, do the parallels between Sir Gawain and Paris go any further? There's a moment at the end where Sir Gawain has to submit himself to what he probably accurately believes will be his demise, right? At mm -hmm. the hands of the green giant. The green giant has, you know, taken one stroke stroke from Gawain's axe and with the promise that Gawain has to take a stroke from his. And so Gawain has to bow down and bear his neck for a stroke from the green giant's axe. Mm -hmm. And he, he does this with a certain amount of valor, not complete valor. I don't want to ruin the whole thing, but he does, you know, he submits himself to the stroke of the axe. Whereas Paris at one point in the book faces Menelaus in a one-on-one -on -one battle mm. and the mm -hmm. the stakes are the entire city mm -hmm. right the winner of this battle takes Helen and all her wealth home and if that's Troy then the Greeks leave and if it's Greece then they get to you know take a lot of wealth and take Helen and go home it should end the war um, in the middle of that Menelaus is thoroughly trouncing Paris and Paris is swept off by Aphrodite to his rooms and instead of doing the honorable thing that a prince should do which is return to the battle because this means the death of your city right if you if you break the law mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so he does not submit himself to the blow of the giant's axe so to speak yeah yeah i i think i although i haven't done it myself where i go through really with an eye to looking at paris um the parallels are so evident in the overall story here comes a person from the outside, now they're in this hospitality code situation. What's the Christian hero going to do? Uh, and the very fact that the first stanza makes reference to Troy, I, and, and, it, and it's kind of peppered throughout. It would be kind of cool to go through and see how many are these overt, <laughs> how many are, are the, uh, is the author who we don't know, um, are there any overt references, more overt references to Paris? Uh, I haven't, I actually haven't done that exercise myself. Well, that would be kind of fun. Cool. And again, the hospitality code that he's referencing, we talked about in a previous podcast, but it was the foundation of the ancient world, right? If I, it, it under, undergirded all travel. If I spend a month getting to Graham's house to say hello and to trade some sheep, when I get there, what I want is a bath, a bed, and a meal. And for him not to talk to me or ask me any questions because I've been on the road for a month um, and probably enduring the dangers of the road, including wild animals and thieves and that sort of thing. And then the next morning he'll entertain me and then he'll give me a gift when I leave, right? So there's there's a lot to happen in the hospitality code with the understanding that I won't steal his daughters or his wife or his goods or besmirch his name. Uh, and if you were to trample on the hospitality code, it would be a pretty egregious offense because it's it's what kept their society running, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So there's definitely like the recap, yeah, the, the thinking of what does the Christian knight do? What does the Christian hero do in, in, in relation to um, this kind of 
of environment where you find yourself where there could be pitfalls, right? Like the pitfalls of the hospitality code sort of get featured in lots of stories Mm -hmm. with Paris and Helen being one of them. So yeah, so that's the Christian night with charity as its highest virtue. We haven't talked about courtly love, which is another Christian night virtue, which is a little more complicated. It has to do with what is the Christian night's attitude towards all women folk. (laughs) (laughs) And then there's also troth. Maybe we can end with troth because you brought it up earlier. Yeah. But troth is the word, it, it is like the honor of the Christian knight that he bestows. So when the Christian knight um, gives his word to his king, it's, um, he is betrothing himself to the king. He has given his troth. He is giving his truth. It is um, when he says that I will fight for you, I will uphold uh, your name, all of the of, of the things that I do going off in the countryside and looking for acts of charity, so saving peasants, killing bandits, slaying dragons, doing these things that are kind of thankless tasks, going off and and, and looking for opportunities to love without without getting anything in return, um, helping peasants from being you know overrun by bandits. Uh, all the peasants can do is say thank you. Um, uh, the Christian knight is then supposed to go home after his sort of adventures and tell the king these stories. He's supposed to come back and say, when I was out this season of knighting, I <laughs> killed four dragons and killed three brigands for you, for our court, so that our name could be known far and wide, so that your name is king. Everyone would say that you are sort of this this wise and, and, and beneficent king. I think that's how you pronounce it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so when you pledge your troth, when you give your word to the king, you are saying that the actions that I do are ultimately going to be reflected on you, my lord and king. Mm-hmm. So you can see how this is a parallel to our Christian mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. The actions that we do as Christians are no longer done for our name, mm-hmm. no longer done for us as uh, Achilles or Odysseus, mm-hmm. but all of these sorts of things are are sort of transposed to somebody else's ledger. Mm -hmm. I have given away my troth. I have given my word um, to the king and all of these actions that I do are ultimately going to be for your name and for your glory and your recognition. Mm -hmm. And the knight is just this agent. Mm -hmm. And because, and so then the, 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 um, uh, the expectation that they have and also the, um, uh, the gifts that they are given is this, armor and is this these swords and is this this sort of material wealth um but it is to be used in the service of sort of this higher calling as opposed to their own name and their own glory it's a very different conception of court than we would have in our politics Mm -hmm. i'd say Mm -hmm. (laughs) imagine if we conducted ourselves in the political realm in the same exact way where we Mm -hmm. consider all of our actions to be to the good and you know support of the name of someone who was Mm -hmm. working above us Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this is the ideal. Now, if you go and you look at the actual history, I mean, it's full of people who are self-serving and it's full of people who are using their knightly um, powers for their own name and their own glory and for raising up their own house and that kind of thing. But the ideal that they held before them, the understanding of of the way that the sort of imperium, the way that the universe was supposed to work uh, um, was this way. Um, which is why, like, yeah, when you move to the more modern period, you have Machiavelli coming in and saying, like, actually, politics works by everybody kind of being jerks to each other. Mm-hmm. It was this, you know, those sorts of mm-hmm. new Renaissance ways of thinking about mm-hmm. power and politics as kind of this um, seen as this break from what was supposed to be an honorable thing, even if maybe if you if you look in medieval history, all the characters of history don't necessarily act that way. Cool. The Song of Roland is a really beautiful example of that, too. Have you made it through it all? I have not read it. Okay, oh, I don't want to give any spoilers, but basically the idea of pledging your troth is usually symbolized by the handing of the glove from the king to the knight or whoever to do the certain responsibility and then the knight handing it back when the responsibility is done. Oh. It's a recurring theme throughout and happens at this really beautiful moment in the beginning that's, excuse me, sorry, near the middle with the death of the main character, but as he's finally holding oh, out Oh, spoilers! His, well, but if you know anything about... Yeah. Right. <laughs> but he holds out his glove in his dying breath oh. to Christ as the ultimate liege lord oh, as he's giving up his soul, and it's it's beautiful. That's good stuff. Anyways, y'all cool. should read it. Fun, right. fun things. Well, one last fun thing about okay. being a knight is when you become a knight, 
You know who uh, in the stereotypical movie scene, the sword touches your shoulders and now you're a knight? Mm-hmm. I, it used to be that the king or whoever was knighting you would full on close fisted punch you in the face. No. And it was, yes, and it was supposed to symbolize, scholars don't really re- know what it symbolized, but w- the best guess was that now that you are a knight, this is the last punch in the face you're going to get without having to uh, have the other person answer for it. So now that you are a Sir Hannon, a Sir A.J. Hannenberg, when somebody hits you, they now have to expect that there's going to be a fight in order to answer that hit. Whereas if you were not a knight, I guess you could get hit all the time. Which is exactly what happens to me. Uh, so <laughs> we should end there. We uh, communally pledge our troth to you, our listener. That's right. And uh, we'll see you next time. That's right. All the things that we are working is for your, for your good. Yep. All right. See you later.